Good morning, everybody. Um, I am going to start the presentation, and it's about my experience or our experience at Ulster University of deploying Skype for Business. So I am Don O'Kane, the Unified Communications Manager at Ulster University, and assisting me will be Dave Miller. So to give you a background, uh, the agenda today is our background, why did we deploy Skype for Business? Where are we today and uh, the Skype for Business challenges and what we would have changed or what our experiences taught us. And then we'll have discussions at the end, so we're open for questions. We might not have the right answers. So just to give you a background on Ulster University, we have four campuses. We have one in Derry, Stroke London Derry. We have one in Coleraine. We have one in Belfast and we have one in Jordanstown. Uh, we are the largest university on the island of Ireland and each campus is equal in size. Uh, we have 2,500 staff currently and we have 26,400 students. Um, we are currently undergoing an ambitious estates plan. Um, we are developing a campus within Belfast and we are going to migrate the majority of Jordanstown campus to Belfast in 2018. Currently we have four agent ISDX systems and we have an imminent demolition of one of them at Korean um, in July 2016. So why did we go down this road? Well, what started it all was seems as announcing the end of life of the ISDX. Uh, we undertook a strategic review about five years ago, two babies ago, and decided that at that stage we would wait and see what Microsoft did. Um, we then proceeded with a full economic appraisal of which I might add 4C assisted with and we costed the project over 10 years. The outcome of that was that we decided to uh, take advantage of our existing campus agreement and our strategic partnership with Microsoft. Um, our, vision for, our vision was an integrated desktop and the opportunity to merge all the campuses as one campus. The solution, um, the partners and products we selected, well obviously we had used 4C so we went out again for consultancy to support and prog program manage the deployments. Um, Freedom won the installation and the, the deployment of the services for what was the link solution then. Uh, Sonos SBCs and SBAs, Polycom phones, um, when we went out we ended up with um, Event Zero UC Commander to deploy the phones. We have opted for Jabra headsets and their personal conference units. Um, we have migrated our services to Gamma. Netcall Contact Center, that existed and that's what we're currently going forward with because we need to retain the voice note system for the ASD access. Um, we have BTS operator consoles because that was to migrate us from the Siemens world into the new world. And Tiger Call Logger, we had that and we're still using that. So where are we today? Well, we did, deployed the Link 2013 pool uh, and in recent months we've upgraded it to Skype for Business because, as we all know, Microsoft um, decided to rebrand from Link to Skype for Business. Uh, the voice solution has been deployed, including the SBS and the SBAs. Uh, we migrated all our carrier systems over to SIP. Um, that was quite seamless. Um, all acceptance tests have been completed. We are now deploying the IP phone solution um, and we're currently testing the manager secondary deployment. Uh, I have rolled instant messaging and presence for all university users. Um, the enterprise voice deployment is now up to about 250 users. And I'm currently rolling out Korean Campus because I have to have that all rolled out by um, summer before they knock down the exchange. And that is where I stop. <laughs> and I'll pass you over to Dave. Thanks, Okay, morning, everybody. Um, one of the key ob objectives of the presentation really is to share with you some of the experience that Ulster have had in that whole journey and moving from a legacy TDM PBX environment to Skype for Business. And it's been a long journey and it's still got some distance to go. Um, 
And Don and I sat down there a couple of weeks ago to think about some of the things that we might want to share with you and the, um, the aspects. And we, we, we came up with a list there. It's, it's not exhaustive by any means of the imagination. Um, but, yeah, there were challenges and decisions had to be taken on purchasing, architecture, deployment, migration, devices, how we dealt with analog, training, support. And every one of those aspects is a project in its own right. So deploying Skype for Business is, is not a project, it's a program. Um, and I think that's perhaps the, the first message I'd, I'd sit with. You have to look at it as a program and identify how you're going to tackle each of these particular aspects. I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. I'd like to leave a reasonable amount of time for Q&A at the end. Um, so I, I might not go into a lot of detail on, uh, on some of these aspects, but if there's something I don't mention and you, you want to come back to it in the Q&A, that's, that's fine. So f first of all, I guess, uh, I guess rolling back to... The point in time when the university had made the decision that the way forward was link, it's probably link 2010 when we made the decision, I think, Donna, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and what are, the, what are the processes and challenges we went through? Well, the, the first decision we had to make was actually how were we actually going to buy and consume link as it was then? Um, the university had a certain amount uh, of existing license rights within the campus agreement, um, and obviously we were being talked to by Microsoft about the rights that the university had under Office 365 for various of the, uh, the education stroke academic licenses where they could consume link through subscription. Um, so we're, we're facing that challenge of how much do we have, how much do we need to buy, how much of it should be perpetual, how much of it should be subscription based. Um, and, and that was a debate that, that took a long time to sort out in conjunction with Microsoft, in conjunction with the, the license partner that, that Ulster has, in conjunction with the Microsoft team within the university. Um, and it, it was far from straightforward. I think that's the observation I would make, and it's an element that, uh, that is worth thinking about quite early in a project. We also had some interesting discussions determining whether we should look at a user or a device-based licensing model. Um, and this was an area that surprised us a little in that when we went to Microsoft to ask their advice and find out exactly what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do, they, they didn't know the answer. We had all the licensing documents from them, we poured through them, there were inconsistencies, there were contradictions in them. And in the end, Microsoft actually sought legal opinion, um, rather ironically from a legal firm in Dublin, in the Republic rather than in the, in the UK, but that's because of the way Microsoft is, uh, is organised over there. Um, and the, the interesting aspect was that the, the university is licensed on the basis of its sort of full-time equivalent headcounts, and those, those people can use any of the, the Microsoft products that are included within that agreement. Um, but of course, when you sit down and look at a telephony deployment in a university, Ulster have got of the order of 5,000 ISDX telephones at this minute in time, only half of those are associated with user accounts. The other half are associated with locations, be it meeting rooms, be it teaching rooms, be it lift phones, be it only a few at Ulster, but kitchens and student residencies, be it lobby phones, etc. Um, and there appears to be no clear answer as to the, the legal licensing position in terms of those. The, the understanding we've come to with Microsoft is that where a device will be they use the word only, will only be used by staff who are otherwise licensed to use link through other licenses, then that device does not need to be licensed. But where that device is in a location where it will be used by people who are not licensed for enterprise voice under any other license agreement, then a device license has to be purchased. So, for example, teaching rooms are a very grey area. Meeting rooms, fairly clear. They're, they're probably university staff. They're okay. Kitchens in student residencies, lobby phones, the view is that those are not covered. The people using those, the students, the visitors are not covered by, by licensing and we need to have device licenses. So, again, not, not very straightforward at all. We, we considered what sort of partner was right in the, in the purchasing stage. Um, in terms of, of Link, Skype for Business, there, there are partners who have got very strong voice background, there are partners who have got very strong Microsoft backgrounds. There are not many who've got very strong backgrounds in both of those areas. Um, because of the driver for the project at Ulster being the replacement of those ISDXs, we took the view that the voice aspect was, was absolutely critical. Um, we wrote the tender documents to select a partner 
uh, with a very heavy emphasis upon voice skills, voice capabilities, and the, the voice design aspects. Um, we, we ended up with a partner in Freedom Communications who have a very strong voice background, and, and I think that's something that we, we feel comfortable with, that, that it has been critical that they have that level of, uh, of, of, no, of knowledge. Procurement. Structuring the procurement. If I go back a couple of slides, um, there are a lot of components to a, to a link stroke Skype for business project. Um, the slight irony in was the decision to go with Microsoft because of an existing relationship and the fact that it, was, it would simplify supplier relationships and procurement, and we end up with, with all of those relationships. Um, so I think it's a case of sitting down and cutting how you're going to procure those, which ones you're going to put together. Um, and as we'll, we'll talk about later, I think we, we feel we broadly got it right at the university, although we might make one or two changes, which I'll, I'll cover later on. Um, and procurement process. Uh, that needs to link in with, with what you're buying and who you, how you want to buy it in terms of frameworks, etc. At the time that Ulster went to the market, uh, which was probably about two years ago now, Donna, we felt that there was not a framework available that would give us a good choice of well-qualified voice, voice-capable link partners at that time. So at Ulster, we made the decision to go with an open procurement process to select that partner. Um, that, that might be a different decision if people are going to the market now because with the, uh, with the new frameworks, and I think we've got some sessions later on today um, from CCS, um, you know, that's a decision that we might make differently today, but we believe was right at the time. Next challenge, architecture. Uh, I guess the first aspect is whether we should be looking at on-premise or hosted. Ulster does have a general strategy towards cloud um, and a preference to, to utilise cloud and deploy cloud where it's appropriate to do so. It's, it's not a mandate. It's a, we must at least consider it. Um, as things stand today, Microsoft will not host Enterprise Voice as part of Office 365. So our choice was looking at a third-party hosting solution um, or utilising an on-premise. Um, and also we took the decision to go on-premise with a view to reviewing that in two or three years' time when, when the market becomes clearer. Um, current information coming out from Microsoft is that they're expecting to launch Enterprise Voice in the US supposedly this side of Christmas um, and in the UK sometime next year, although it's early days in terms of what the, uh, the shape of that will be. Um, we looked and spent quite a lot of time looking at reference architectures and um, we, we did some work with Microsoft at the outset of the project because we, we felt we were so early, this is going back two years ago, um, that we, we wanted to talk to Microsoft and the university had, has a relationship, had access to Microsoft professional services. So we asked Microsoft to, to design the high level, uh, the high level architecture. Um, which they did, they delivered us an architecture which was very much what they call their reference architecture which, which comes out of a book. Um, when we sat down and we mapped that onto the university's infrastructure, it, it wasn't a good fit. Um, the whole uh, strategy of looking at dual pools only works if your infrastructure and the way your data centres are structured can actually support that. So at Ulster we, we took a decision to actually move away a little bit from, from Microsoft's pure reference architecture um, with a view that we'll probably move back towards that in two or three years' time when the data centre strategy is finalised once the, the Belfast campus is open. Um, and I think we, we felt that was, a, that was a decision which actually helped us out quite a lot. We would, we would have had some unintended complexities if we'd attempted to shoehorn a reference architecture into the university's architecture. Um, and we'd have been putting a lot of effort into some resilience capability that actually wouldn't have delivered very much um, because... The, the network wouldn't have been able to support the resilience anyway. So we, we did put our effort into voice architecture and survivability. And again, because the driver of the project in Ulster was very much around replacing the ISDX systems, we took a view that we have to deliver a very robust voice solution. And so a lot of effort went into looking at the voice architecture and how we designed that to be pretty, pretty solid in terms of uh, survivability. Okay. Deployment. A couple of quick things. Time scales. Everything on this project has taken a lot longer than we expected it to at the outset. Um, I, I don't think any of the partners we've been working with would, would deny the second bullet that they have been learning as we've went, gone through the process. 
Um, and that, that is not just talking about freedom, the deployment partner. We're talking about Polycom in terms of how to deploy their devices. We're talking about some of the, the third party suppliers. We're talking about the core logging with Tiger. Um, everybody has been learning. And because Microsoft shifted the goalposts halfway through the project to Skype for Business, everybody's had to learn it all twice. So ev everything has taken a lot longer than we expected. From a migration perspective, again, we. There are lots of choices in terms of how to go about the, the migration. Um, we looked at it by user, we looked at it by department. I think we'd have, we'd have preferred to be able to do it by department. However, because of the timescales at Ulster with us imminently trying to hold the bulldozers off at the uh, Coleraine PBX room, uh, we're now being driven very much by a geographic basis. In, in some ways that's simpler because we can focus on one ISDX at a time. Um, yes, we're, we're aware that one or two of the user departments, it means that they won't get their services all at the same time. Um, we did take a view to put IAM and presence out first, so every managed desktop anyway in the university now has IAM and P capability. Um, it has been publicised, although quietly, I think, is, uh, is, is, is the truth of the matter. Um, but the message is starting to get out there fairly quickly now, and we're starting to see, uh, see take up of that grow quite quickly. Um, the other aspects, I think what we're really trying to stress there is that we've got IM and P, we've got enterprise voice users, we've got devices, we've got the legacy analog estate. Every one of those is actually a migration project in its own right. Um, and they, they're all quite separate projects um, in terms of how we go about that. When you add on to that things like moving over the operator console solution, moving over the, um, the netcall contact center, um, there, there are a lot of individual projects involved in migration here. The devices challenge, should we use IP hard phones, should we use soft clients, should we use smartphones? Um, and, and this is one that we've, we've, to be honest, we've gone round in circles over the two years that we've been debating this uh, at Ulster. Um, I, I guess one thing we, we did fairly quickly at the outset of the project, because we could not find a reference in the UK at least, who had um, deployed Skype for Business in its entirety to replace a PBX on the scale that Ulster was talking about, we, we took up a lot of references with institutions on a global basis. Our project board required us to do that before they would sign off the, uh, the implementation stage of the project. Um, and one interesting thing that came back from all of that was don't rely upon Wi-Fi, especially on smartphones. Um, a number of organisations said they'd attempted, they'd gone into the process thinking that, hey, great, we won't need to buy phones. We, everybody's got a smartphone. We'll just put a client on the smartphone. The reality of life, every one of them said, was that it's great for people to have as an addition and an adjunct and to use on a, if it's working basis, but it, it just the whole solution was not robust enough for people to have as their primary communications uh, device. Um, so we, we took that advice and certainly at Ulster, while we're allowing people to deploy the Wi-Fi clients, the, sorry, the smartphone clients over Wi-Fi, um, it will not be anybody's primary device. Um, we, we originally set out very much to try and mandate headsets and move to soft clients. Uh, that, that plan has been somewhat diluted as we've gone through the, the project and there's, there's been a number of reasons for that. One, one is that there are simply some users who are hostile towards headsets and no matter what you do, you will not persuade them to use them. Within Skype for Business, uh, the lack of an audible ringer, if you're using a headset and your PC doesn't happen to have inbuilt speakers, has, has proved to be a massive stumbling block. Um, and that in itself has, has meant that some users were not prepared to take care uh, to headsets. They might do for every other purpose, but the fact that if that headset is not sitting on their ears when an inbound call comes in, then there's a strong chance of them missing it meant that that was not an acceptable solution to them. There are some third party devices you can buy USB devices to plug in and give an audible ring or give a flashing light, but they, they cost tens of pounds again per user. You start to put the cost up quite significantly. Um, and finally, when we actually sat down and, and looked at it, the, the cost case was not actually compelling for headsets. Yes, we might go out and we might buy a 30, 40 pound headset rather than a 70, 80 pounds um, IP phone, but that headset's a personal device. If we have a turnover of staff, we'll have to provide the new member of staff with a personal headset. How long are headsets and phones going to last? We're hoping and expecting to get seven years plus, hopefully 10 years plus, out of an IP telephone. Out of a headset, maybe a couple of years, 
if they're, if they're an active user. So I think when you sit down and you do the sums as an organisational wide perspective, headsets do not cost in. Admittedly, the, the approach we were going to take at Ulster was the project would pay for the first one, and after that, we'd, we'd push the cost onto the user departments. Um, so, from a project perspective, we might have saved a bit of money, but for the institution as a whole, it was probably going to cost them more. So, I think we're, we're probably expecting to be in excess of 50% IP phones now when we roll out. We will still give users the option of, uh, of that. Um, running through some of the other aspects, um, I think jump down to better together. Um, this is better together as a function in Skype for Business to enable the, um, the handset and the desk phone client to talk to each other. Um, it, the observation I simply make is that, it, that it's mandatory. If you don't use it and you don't deploy it, the user's effectively got two devices on their desk that, that don't really talk to each other. Jumping through a little bit, analogs. Uh, yeah, it's a challenge, I think. Um, long and short of it, happy to talk about some of those specifics on there and, and think the slides are available. But the, the conclusion we've come to very much in Ulster is that we are going to drive out as many analogue devices as we possibly can. And we may end up not supporting any analogue devices on the Skype solution at all because it is, it is not a trivial process. Uh, and one of the final nails in the coffin of that was the, the fact that we were utilising tenor gateways for analog devices um, and we did a lot of work working with Freedom, working with Sonus, working with, uh, with Microsoft to properly work out the configuration to have those devices as objects within Link where we could manage them and the upgrade to Skype for Business broke all of that. So if we had deployed we would be in a mess. Fortunately we have, we have not deployed any analog devices as yet um, so I think our conclusion of that is analogs and Skype for Business don't really go well together. Um, there are ways and means, but it's, it's an exception. Training-wise, um, a lot of debates there, and when we did the due diligence, we found some very different approaches. Some organisations who took the, the approach, well, it's Skype, people know how to use it. Um, we don't need to train. Others who, who, who did a lot. Um, we've taken the view at Ulster of, of providing a lot of collateral and, and utilising that as a mechanism. So we've, we've done videos, we've done train the trainer and we will do more. We're, we're appointing UC ambassadors. Um, so our, our, our philosophy is very much to make sure the information is out there and to try and have some champions within the departments. Um, from a support perspective, I, I guess the key things there are it's not a simple support model. Um, there are an awful lot of people involved and a lot of those are in-house so you've got to have a hybrid approach and involving the in-house Microsoft teams, the in-house server teams, the in-house network teams at an early stage um, is, is critically important and although that's, that's important on any IP telephony and UC deployment I think we've found with, uh, with Skype the, the interdependencies on other aspects of the general Microsoft environment are very very high. So the, the dependency in those areas is, is very high indeed. So last couple of slides very quickly. What, what we got right? Um, I think having the strong input to the architecture we, we felt was very important. Risk sharing with the implementation partner. I, I've mentioned earlier you know, that our implementation partner was learning as well. And if we hadn't clearly defined what we expected the outputs to be, there, there could have been some awkward conversations, I think. You know, everybody put more time into this than they expected to at the outset. But the contract that we had meant that that, that risk was shared. Um, procurement strategy, did we get all of that right? I think we got most of it right. The only thing we might change now would be we didn't put the devices in with the main deployment contract. We, we might change that in the future. But at the time, the device market was not sufficiently mature. Um, we, we did the carrier services in the middle of the deployment, which, although it might sound a little bit obtuse, actually worked very well because we had all the right engineering resources fully scaled up and available at the right time. We weren't having to bring people back, um, which worked well. Um, and jumping perhaps down to the, the last one is, is building a team and, and including legacy partner cooperation is absolutely critical. We were very fortunate in that um, the Unify engineer um, based out in Ulster, has, has taken this as a challenge, not as a, not as a threat, to be honest. Well, yes, Unify are losing the business, but the, the engineer himself has, has formed a real part of the project team and has, has worked very hard to get the integrations that we need during the two to three year migration process working. Um, without that cooperation, we would have found it very difficult indeed. 
What would have done differently? Uh, okay, the top two points, yeah, completely contrary to each other. What do I mean? We'd have started 18 months earlier, because everything takes longer than you expect it to. But we'd have started 18 months later, because Microsoft have changed so much that we've had to redo quite a lot of things going through this, this project. Um, I, th I think a couple of things that we pull out particularly might be training. Um, we, we went for a process based on a lot of knowledge transfer in the early days. Um, whilst that's important, I think the need for some formal training for the administrators and the managers within the, within the university has, has proven to be necessary as well. Um, resources, huge amount of resources required at the, um, the deployment stage, partly because some of the administrative tools, particularly for devices in Microsoft, are not as intuitive and cannot be readily scripted. So we, we're, at the moment, we're looking to scale up quite significantly our resources for the deployment. And yeah, I guess we'd, it's taken a long time to get there with devices and with the analog devices, and we'd probably have started that sooner as well. It, in summary, though, I'll ask us again another six months when, when we've got a whole campus rolled out and when we've, uh, we've got that experience of six months of, uh, of real production system under our belts. And I've probably only left two minutes, I think, for questions. <laughs> so apologies for that, but don't know, hap happily take any questions or we're here during the coffee breaks, lunch breaks for the rest of the day. <laughs> hi, it's, uh, it's Tomo from London Business School. Yeah, I'm hi, also Tommy. a Link convert. We've done Link as PBX replacement. Um, I agree on the disruptive effect of the transition from Link to Skype for Business. We're still on Link 2013 because yeah. we just can't suffer that headache at the moment. Uh, the common area licensing for shared devices, we got completely different advice. And it doesn't surprise me. That's right, and that is Microsoft licensing yeah. for you. Um, but we're told in no uncertain terms that our headcount for FTE covers all student and all ad hoc use of any shared device across the campus. Well, it the, the counterpart to that, as we've been told quite clearly, it does not cover students. <laughs> yeah. It covers them for everything except enterprise voice. Right. But for enterprise voice, so they cannot make an enterprise telephone yeah. call. So students are covered, but PhD students are not. They're, where the other for way us. Around. So go figure. PhD yeah. students are seen as staff, so they're Yeah, that's right, covered. yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, and I think the only other thing we've found with handsets going out is that they're great for just answering calls and stuff but when you want to do online meetings the amount of background noise picked up from the actual microphone of the handset actually disrupts the online meeting and that's where headsets really come into their own so that's our experience we, we, that point. one of the downsides of using handsets is a lot of people have a headset as well yeah we we, we do recognize that has to be factored into the, the cost case yeah okay so the question starts here, please. Hello. And what problems, did you, what problems do you think you would have having um, using smartphones over Wi-Fi? You said it wasn't suitable. Um, it's experience. We, we haven't gone out and tried it at all. So it, was, it came from feedback from due diligence that we did with a lot of organisations who, who were relatively early adopters of, uh, of Link, but certainly people who were attempting to run Link 2013 clients. Now, they said part of it was their Wi-Fi infrastructure, part of it seemed to be the stability of the client, part of it is the interaction between the, the native phone client and the, um, the Skype for Business client. Um, you end up in some devices with, you might be on a Skype call and if you get a native call coming into the device, it interrupts it, automatically puts it on hold. I think that happens with Apple devices. Um, so it was the whole user experience was, was found and every single person, and we talked to at least half a dozen who tried to do it, every single one of them said, do not use it as your primary device. And it might be worth quite nice, but we have a Wi-Fi network, but 